everyone. Great to see everybody. Got, we're just admitting people. And uh, welcome, Nancy. I see you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I just want to say how excited I am about today. I'm kind of bursting and all the teeth are going to blow out of my face soon because I just can't wait to get started. So I'm going to welcome you to the, the series and the episode and say a few words of welcome to our campus, etc. cetera. Uh, you know the spiel. And then I will introduce our very special guest and we will have a wonderful conversation. We always like to start by welcoming you to our campus and of course acknowledging the land that we're on. We're, we want to acknowledge and thank the Lekwungen and Kosapsum people, also known as Songhees and the Squimalt First Nations communities for allowing us to live, work, learn, play on their lands. We also give thanks to the ancestors, supernatural ones, creatures, big and small, hereditary leaders and matriarchs for looking after the rich resources and cultural teachings of this beautiful land. And I just want to point out that this is actually where, this is my home. That path is where I live. It's near Mystic Vale in uh, Cadro Bay in Victoria. And I'm on the, the same ancestral lands. And this is the path that I take into my office every day at Royal Roads University. So it's pretty neat how parallel my life really is. And I'm sure that's on purpose. Uh, I really miss the campus. Of course, during COVID, we've all been working from our homes, but, um, I, I have a piece of it in my own backyard as well. Royal Roads is an, a, an amazing place. And I always like to preface any of our episodes with a bit of an introduction to the university uh, because it all blends in and integrates with the purpose behind this webinar series. But before I do that, I want to also acknowledge that I'm supported, of course, by an amazing team of women, Alana McConaughey, Amara Angus, and Karen Sequera, who support all of our webinars that we offer through our School of Communication and Culture and uh, who will be there supporting you and, and helping me to notice questions as they pop up in the chat, but also making sure that I stay cool and calm <laughs> as I deliver these kinds of things. This is the Rose Garden. We are on an amazing 300 hectares of old growth forest and, and a, an estate that was built back in the 1900s. And this rose garden is right beside my office. I literally have to stop and smell the roses if I go anywhere. This is our castle uh, that we've also inherited. We have a very funny background and mixed heritage, but it's all part of us acknowledging the colonialism that we also have to face on our, on our territory here. This is um, the site of many famous movies. Uh, and this is one of the X-Men. Uh, Ryan Reynolds actually did a little pose and posted on Instagram giving us some promotion. But that's the castle that you'll see in those movies. But mostly, you know, Royal Roads is a place where uh, working professionals come and learn together. And we acknowledge, we acknowledge learning in so many different ways. And I love that. I really identify with that at Royal Roads because I believe athletes bring so much learning to their uh, institutions and their organizations as well. And that's why I've been delivering webinars on sport leadership and social change. Rural Roads is all about social change. Our seven schools are all focused and interdisciplinary and geared toward transformational change in the world through various, uh, very po various positive kind of avenues of learning. Uh, we have schools that focus on development, diversity and inclusion, programming around education, the environment, equity and human rights, health, media, discourse, and peace. And all of these things, I think, sport can take a real leadership role in, in promoting, developing, fostering, advancing as well. So the integrations are amazing. This bridge is in our Japanese garden, and, and our school in particular has taken this bridge on as a metaphor. We believe that communication is really all about building bridges, but in order to build an effective bridge, we need to mind the gap first. We need to understand the differences between the two sides before we extend our hand in a handshake. That means that work has to be put in and understanding and embracing the diversity of individuals that we interact with in our daily life. This is a, a testament to some of the partnership we have with different sport organizations. We welcome athletes into Rural Roads in much the same way, way we do with all working professionals by acknowledging the learning they bring. So if you're spending time on a rugby field, you're learning all sorts of relevant, fabulous skills that can contribute to your role in society as well and, and help foster you and develop you into a leader. 
So this webinar series is really in honor of that, the role that sport can play and the leadership role that it can play in fostering positive social change in our world. This episode, our first episode was kind of an overview and introducing people to all the different ways sport can, can be leader, a leadership, or sorry, leader in the world. And uh, episode two is really about women. And I wanted to get this topic up early in the series because I think the issue of gender, gender equality in sport or gender equity in sport really is an intersection point for so many issues in sport, but also in the world. You know, it's a real incubator uh, where we can, we can examine and understand what needs to change in the world. And our guest today is going to speak to that brilliantly. We've come a long way, you know, from uh, Catherine Switzer's marathon, first marathon efforts to, to now where, where young girls are on the field and, and battling with their counterparts. And we can do it, right? That's never been a question. Women are capable, but we still face incredible barriers in sport. So I'd like to kick off with a bit of an interactive activity. You know me and you, you love me. Uh, you, people are like, don't make us go into teams. Don't make us go into break us. You, you've got to be involved. If you're going to make change, you've got to take responsibility and step up. So I always like to get people involved in doing some kind of activity. And so I'd like to invite you to a Jamboard. There's a link in the chat. If you open up the chat, you'll see the link. Highlight that, plunk it into your browser, on your phone, on your computer, doesn't matter, and you'll open up a little Jamboard. And what you'll see is this screen here. And you just go to a little sticky note and uh, then you can post some of your thoughts, any of your thoughts, your comments, your opinions about gender equity in sport. What are some of the challenges you see, issues, opportunities? What are your arguments? I've heard them all. <laughs> Barriers. What's the real problem in your mind? And so what I'll do now is go to that little site and I hope to see some, put some pressure on you now to uh, post some post-its. So you just go over here to this little posty here and you can start to add in some of your comments and um, ideas. What are some opportunities for women in sport? Yeah, and if you find a, um, yes, that a post it goes on top of another one, you can drag them over and, and make space for yours. And as those are being posted, we can kind of read and enjoy some of these comments. And I find this is so great online learning allows for so many voices, right, all at once. So I'm blabbing away here, but you also have an opportunity to participate. And we have lots of people contributing all at once. So it's beautiful. And then we have these wonderful technologies where we can have a shared workspace and learn together, read each other's comments and get sparked, just like we do in a classroom. But it's quiet, hey? <laughs> Love it. Okay, keep going, keep going. I think uh, that our guest, Nancy hogshead Makar will be talking about a lot of these, these concepts as they weave into some of her initiatives and efforts, her coups, I like to call them as well. She's made some amazing advances for women in sport and in other areas of sport and been a real hero to us, I have to say. Um, and so investing equally, uh, balancing media coverage, the, oh, the media, the role of the media, accessibility, and what kind of issues and barriers and challenges that uh, does that raise for a sexualization of women. I heard, uh, I listened to a Gloria Steinem interview, and she talked about women, sport being so great for women because it, it tells women, young women in particular, that their bodies are instruments, not ornaments. Loved it. Market economy. Yeah, that's often the argument. Oh, well, you know, suck it up. You guys don't bring in as much cash as the men do, so you don't get paid the same way. That's fine, except there's arguments against that as well. Awesome. So we'll come back to this as well, and you can. It'll be linked in the PowerPoint that we share later, and it'll show up in the, in the um, recording, and you'll be able to have a look at the conversation, the discourse around and I invite you to continue with it, right? We can add pages and, and this is a way for us to continue discussing and, and learning. Thank you very much for participating. You're all good sports. All right, I also wanna highlight that in March, we're going to have another kind of another version of this, another episode. There are so many fantastic women that I had to have a couple of episodes devoted to it. And this is Tricia Smith and she's agreed to play. I, she's a former crewmate, so I have some leverage. <laughs> but she's the president of COC and a member of the IOC, Inter International Olympic Committee. 
And she tells me a story of how when uh, the argument was to get rid of some of the women's events in rowing at the Olympic level, especially the women's eight, she said, oh, that's very, she's very calm. That's very interesting, an interesting argument. Can you tell me how many women, how many men's eights are entered right now? You know, it might be 12. And how many women? Oh, well, there's nine or 10. Wow, and women have only been rowing since 1976, she says. It's amazing how far they've come. And you've only got 14 entries for men? You've been rowing for 200 years. Hmm. And she moves along, just makes that point very uh, gently, but very aggressively as well. And I'll also have Lorraine Lafreniere and Alison Sanmar Graves, who are both uh, representing powerful organizations in sport in Canada. We have a lot of great women leaders uh, leading the way in sport and making real change. So I'll invite them as well. They've supported lots of programming around getting girls into sport, advancing women in sport, education, gender equity, policy, and research. And I just wanted to throw this slide up too, so that we're thinking about equity and equality. They're different things. And I love this um, second picture here of equality, equity, and liberation. Uh, you know, let's take down the barrier. Let's take down the fence that we're struggling to see over in the first place. And I think that's a really important point. You know, what are the actual roots of the problem that we should be tackling? And I think uh, Sue Bird does a good job in response to this meme where they compare Sue and LeBron James and their accomplishments are exactly the same, and yet their compensation is ridiculously disparate. Uh, you know, he makes 37 million, she makes 250,000. But what she says, and I thought it was quite, quite gracious, but also very pointed and insightful. Yeah, we, we want equality, but when we say that, we're not talking about necessarily about equal pay right now. In actuality, we're asking for media coverage and corporate sponsor look. She says, once we build the business, of course it will build, and then yes, we'll get paid the same. So it shows such an intelligent insight into the actual challenge we're facing. We can do it. Women, of course, can play sport. Of course, we're just as strong. Uh, we don't need to waste our time trying to prove that, but it's interesting how the discourse gets shifted into that realm. It's a bit of a slippery slope kind of argument. Obviously, we're capable. This is a recent story. These are our Canada Women Sevens. You know, they're Olympic sport. They've been given great funding. And guess what? They're fabulous. They're top of the pool all the time. And uh, they fill stadiums. Our Canadian soccer team does the same. Now, today, I was supposed to have Kate Burness. But guess what? Today was media day for her in the end. She found it on Sunday, sent me a note. So I interviewed her on Monday. Uh, Kate Burness is a TSN sports anchor with Sports Center. You'll know her for, you know, Olympics, NBA draft. She covers a lot of great media um, events. But she's also gotten behind women in sport, and she developed an initiative called Her Mark. It's an annual summit where she invites women, uh, young women from all over the region to meet to meet great women leaders in sport. And you know, that philosophy, if you can see it, you can be it. So she introduces young women to those and shows, shows these young girls that, hey, women are leading all over the world in all different ways. She's also turned that into a podcast and, and hosted a special this year during COVID. She's uh, part of one of the first female sports center teams with Natasha Stanislavski and she's a fitness advocate and trainer. I wasn't actually able to bring her on today because she's busy with media day, but I interviewed her and we'll offer that as kind of a bonus feature after this webinar. I'm actually quite grateful because I'd rather spend a whole, you know, a lot of time with Nancy. I think she'll have so much to share and so much to teach you all. Another person I was able to interview though was Sheila Robertson and we'll add that as another bonus feature to this. So when this recording comes out, we'll also have these other two kind of outtakes, right? And so Sheila is like the mother of all sport in Canada. She's a writer, editor, communications professional. She started Champion Magazine in 1977, Canadian Journal for Women and Coaching in 1992, The Coaches Report in 92. She's written multiple books on women in sport and advancing women in sport. She's really shy and didn't want to be part of the webinar. So uh, although she writes and, and is involved in all these different ways, she's not real a real fan of self-promotion. So I was lucky enough to spend an hour with her and I think you'd love to listen to her, uh, her stories and her, her memories. Uh, she's really a, a vault of amazing 
memories and knowledge about women in sport in Canada, our history in Canada. So a wonderful listen to that as well. And now we've got Nancy Hogshead Nacar, and we are so lucky to have her because I know how busy she is. The word relentless keeps coming up in all of the, uh, the material I read about Nancy and the work that she's been doing. I, she blows my mind at how much she's accomplished in her life. And uh, I, I was just, I, I got to say again, I was kind of like, my heart rate was racing. I got a call from her the other day and I was telling my whole family about it <laughs> and uh, kind of showing off, you know. But Nancy has so much to share. Uh, started as a, a, an Olympic swimmer, multiple gold medalists you see down on the right. I love, you know, showing those pictures of, of these people as athletes so you get the sense of how relentless she was in the pool. And now look at her as a leader in society, leading change in sport uh, across the world, not just in her own country. And we're hoping to partner our countries more fully as well. So let me introduce Nancy. I'm going to bring her up. Uh, you can read a little bit more about her here, but I'm sure she'll tell us lots about her initiatives, her background, and let's get out of here. Excellent. And bring up Nancy. Hello. So great to see you. I have lots of questions, but... Um, <laughs> Hi, Jen. How are you? Absolutely fabulous. Yeah, thanks for that nice introduction. I appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. So I have a few questions for you, but I also want to leave lots of space for you to share as much as you want, promote any initiatives you want to promote and teach people about the work that you're, that you're working so hard to achieve. Um, and also invite people to participate. So if you have any links you want to share or put up there, we can get them out to the to our communities and our networks. We have uh, lots of people watching today, but we'll have lots who come back and watch the recording as well. That's how it seems to play out, right? Yeah. I'd like to start by asking you about sport and what sport has meant to you. You know, what role has it played in your life? What, what have you learned? Um. I am a sucker for all of those Olympic videos where you see, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And, you know, you watch people, um, you know, with sort of everything that the Olympics represents of the best of the best and this sense of integrity and this sense of, you know, uh, hum shared humanity, our shared connection with each other. Um, um, one of my favorite memories from the 1984 Olympics was <clears throat> somebody from Japan coming up and saying, wow, thanks a lot. You really did it for us. And I was like, who is this us you're talking about? But I, I, it took me a while. It was only 22 at the time to figure out that, that, that when I go to watch any sporting event, um, particularly at those elite levels, like there is something about like, like, look what we can do as humanity, right? I feel the same way when I go to an amazing concert or if I go to, you know, see great art. It is, um, you know, really represents when somebody has their 10,000 hours. I just find it inspiring. Brilliant. And what, what do you think, uh, you know, what, how has sport led you to where you are now? Has it played a role in some of that decision making? And, and well, I mean, it's like actually my, so I have uh, three kids you saw in the picture and I have a 20 year old son, 15 year old twin girls. <clears throat> and one of the girls, I said something about my growing up and I said, you know, I swam, blah, blah, blah. And my one daughter turns to the other daughter and says, do you know mom used to swim? And she was like being kind of sarcastic about it. I was like, it's almost impossible for me to talk about my life without also talking about sport because from the age of uh, seven till 22, I that was so immersed in swimming. And those of you that know what it takes to be an elite swimmer as opposed to other sports, you know, I talked to, you know, Carl Lewis and um, say sprinters or divers or sports where like it takes a, sort of that power kind of thing. Swimming doesn't have heat and gravity to, to that limit how much a human body can do. So you can go a lot further and do a lot more. So from seventh grade until I graduated from high school, I was up at 4.45 in the morning. We swam from 5.30 to 7.30. And then um, we, it, my school went from eight to four. And then in the middle of the day, we had PE where the swimmers, we either lifted weights or ran on alternate days. And then it was two more hours after school. 
So it was it was pretty all consuming in um, in you know in training and making the Olympic team. And I definitely had my ten thousand hours by the time that uh, I got to the to the 1984 Olympics. Um, so what so so with that background, um, I knew when I was in college that I wanted to be a lawyer that represented women. And I just thought that through sport was the best way for me to do it, right? I could have just gotten, just done employment law for women, or I could have done, um, you know, worked at a DA's office and prosecuted sexual assault. I could, have, right, there's a million different things that I could have done, but I thought, hmm, sport is probably the best way for me to, um, to, um, uh, to make sure that women have opportunities because I am such a firm believer on um, what sport does for a person mm -hmm. having that opportunity, but particularly for women having that opportunity. And fortunately now we've got so much great research out there that shows that it is undeniable of what a sports experience does for somebody for the rest of their life in terms of more education and more employment and better health and these, these hard metrics on what it means uh, to have that sports experience. Um, I, I feel like, you know, if more sport leaders knew about these metrics, then we would, we would see athletic departments doubling in size. Um, and certainly schools would, would not be um, so resistant to providing women with equal opportunities in sports. That's really great. You have that faith. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. And when I, when I, when I find something, Jen, where um, I where like, I think that's interfering with the, the mission of sports and inculcating all these values in people, then I want to, I want to address it and get it out of sport. Awesome. We're so grateful to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And what has, what has sport taught you that's helping you face up to these challenges? Like they're, they're pretty big barriers, some of these, you know, there's some real sure. attitude. What, how has sport helped you do that? Well, I have to say there were days in when I was training where I did not want to get into the water with every cell in my body. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's something that, that kids, today asked me about like, how did you keep going through all those years? And um, there, one thing that I learned that still is with me today is that um, even on those days that you don't want to, that um, to kind of take that conversation and just like put it aside and just get to work on whatever it is that there is to do. Um, you know, I, I, um, uh, I, I find that to be a valuable one as today I was having all kinds of technology issues and like I wanted to like shoot the computer and <laughs> I call my IT guy and ah and uh, right but it's like okay you gotta you know focus anyway so that that is one of the ways that I'm really grateful that um, you can you can have a bad day and not attach a lot of meaning to it. So uh, some of my competitors that I trained with or whatnot, I watched them have terrible practices where they were, were they and, and me too, we'd be like 10% off where we should be in practice, right? But just really having a bad one and like not having it mean anything, just going on, right? And so same thing with having a bad day at work is not really putting a lot of meaning to it, so that, so that, you know, you, you do have more resilience. You can, you know, it doesn't mean that you're a terrible person. It doesn't mean that you're, um, you have something desperately that you need to fix in yourself or um, you're not fatally flawed or whatnot. Nope. You had a terrible practice and yeah, come back tomorrow. Yeah. There's yeah. another, I think, you know, we're in these very relentless sports of rowing and swimming where it's just another stroke, another stroke, another stroke. And that's what I love about it. You just have another stroke, right? You always get another one, another day, another practice. Yeah, awesome, great lesson. And great thing for people to be learning and can learn in a lot of different sports, right? Falling down, getting back. Oh, yeah. Awesome, taking it. Right. 
why why sport you know you've talked about it obviously has a big impact it's a great avenue for people to be learning and and why else you know what else has drawn you to just keep fighting for for good sport better sport in the world what's motivating you yeah well um i think sport make makes women feminists i think that sports makes women appreciate their bodies and it makes them appreciate um um you know, one of the first things that any totalitarian government will do is try to take away women's sports. I mean, that should right there tell you something about how liberating that being uh, in sports is for women. It's no accident that such a high percentage, uh, it's 96% um, of all C-suite women were athletes. As you go down to the vice president level, and then you get right manager, and as you go down the corporate structure, you see fewer and fewer athletes, right? So there, it's just it's no coincidence that um, that it is. It's really empowering. Um, you know, I have to say also, you know, one of the main issues that I've been working on for the last ten years has to do with sexual abuse in sports. Um, one of the people that's watching right now, somebody I admire very much, Jill Yesko. Mm -hmm. She, uh, yeah, she did a, uh, made a, an amazing video that I require all my students to watch. Um, I've been teaching for uh, ever, but she wrote a, um, she, she uh, made a, a documentary called Broken Trust. And uh, <clears throat> one, so one of the, one of the issues that takes away from all this amazing stuff that it can do is sport that, that a pedophile is going to use sport as a way to get access to kids. And I, I actually, one of the reasons why I think it's so important to get these people out of there is that, um, that you know, I, I was somebody who suffered from a, a very serious traumatic rape when I was in college. Um, I was out running, Duke has two campuses. And, um, and it was through sport that I was able to find so much healing. And I want other people to have that, right? We know that like, how do people recover from PTSD when their brains are a little too lit up from something very traumatic is hard, hard physical exercise. Um, you know, um, yeah, that's one of my people ask me for advice. I'm not a therapist. I always like to say <laughs> I'm not a therapist. It's I'm a lawyer. It's not what I do. But one of the things that uh, that helped me dramatically was being able to be doing hard, hard physical labor and having a space where I could cry and I could get angry and I could um, I could rage at the world in this appropriate place that. I wasn't going to hurt anybody else. And I, I could, you know, I had in swimming as opposed like, and you know, in tennis, like you really have to be focused on the ball, not so much in swimming, your mind can kind of, you know, kind of go do its own thing. And, um, you know, I would, uh, I would re-engage with this guy who, who um, grabbed me and, and, but this time I had a machete and this time I could whack and blood could fly everywhere. <laughs> like rather than, you know, in, in, in real life, I lost. Yeah. In, but, but I could replay it over and over again. It turns out, I mean, those of you who are therapists out there, like sport gave me a way to engage in this um, type of therapy where I got to reclaim who it was, who I was. So, you know, there's, there's so much um, that comes out of sport um, and how important it is that we make sure that not only that girls have that opportunity, not only do they get paid the same way and do they get the same scholarship dollars and whatnot, but also they get treated the same way because we want to make sure that all of the, the things that I just talked about, this amazing research, that it it actually happens that we can um, uh, that um, um, the promise of sport has the ability to shine through. Somebody like a Larry Nasser, somebody like um, my coach Mitch Ivy, who is on the banned list, he will never be able to coach again, um, doesn't interfere with that. Mm -hmm. Right. We know sexual assault and sexual abuse is a huge problem out in society, but it is uniquely 
part of a problem in sport in that um, uh, uh, we, we, in society, we teach kids to be obedient and compliant. And <clears throat> in, as soon as somebody has like a, when, when, they, when they can see themselves as being bigger than who they see themselves right now, and they have that goal and you, you give them a carrot or a, you know, like they, they get a vision of where they want to go in life and a, um, a bad person can exploit that, that hunger, that sense of wanting it for their own nefarious ends. And, um, you know, that hunger is a beautiful thing. That hunger is something that will, that makes people transcendent. It is the hunger is what makes, you know, you know, I, I describe what it's like to, to be swimming at sort of at an Olympic level of swimming. And it feels, um, it feels like swimming's doing you. It feels like beauty and strength and effortlessness and this connection with God and this ease and grace. And it feels like it just, it feels mm -hmm. amazing. And guess what? You don't have to be Olympian to get that. Most people who participate in sports any length of time, as soon as they kind of they get the fundamentals, they get sort of a taste of it. They get an access to that, and that is, is, um, is, you know, it is so. Um, and we right. So that is a God's gift, and that's what we need to cherish. That's what we need to um, make sure that that kids have, and that you know, a pedophile or some, some, uh, some abusive coach that just wants to prove how, you know, how tough they can be doesn't get in the way of, of how, of what sport has to offer. Beautiful, beautifully said. I'm so glad we have this recorded. You were just stunning <laughs> when you were just, oh. <laughs> but you're the promise. I love that word promise. And it's so sad when you describe the power of sport and then for it to be corrupted somehow it's just like mm -hmm. well, mind blowing and um and needs to be addressed you use the word address it yeah out, right. fought out yeah it's um it's a beautiful thing and it it can play a, an important role now you see something like i i'm gonna go a little off script here because i shared some some questions but i'm sure you have opinions about this you know the maggie haney story right gymnastics mm -hmm. gymnastics and and the New York Times gave her a platform to to share her um, defense, right, of the uh, the accusations, the allegations around emotional psychological abuse, and it was amazing, you know, that the same old kind of trope that came out of um, well, there, she said, I, I will coach differently in the future. I won't seek perfection because it's not possible, apparently, you know. So she used her platform to further abuse her athletes. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to say that I know the author and I know that they wanted to give her an opportunity to um, uh, to say her piece. And I, I respect that. Um, it could have been more balanced and it could have shown that what she said and that philosophy of um, you know, I'm being tough or I'm, uh, right. There wasn't countered with anything on the other side, right there. And which is just nonsense that you have to be abusive in order to get that God spirit that you have to get that, that connection with like knowing yourself. I mean, it, that that's the opposite of everything I just described about the beauty of being really good at sport is not that it is. Um, and you know, there, it's, it, it's, it's, um, 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 what, what you don't want to leave a kid with is this idea that, um, that they didn't do it, that the coach did it, mm -hmm. that, um, right, that they were just so lucky to, right, but, and that's just ego getting in the way of, what is what how it's supposed to be i mean look there's no way that i would in a million years that i would have been in the olympics 
um, or been an elite swimmer, but for phenomenal coaching. And I was really lucky throughout my life to have some amazing coaching. Um, so I don't want to underplay the importance of having a good coach. Um, but it, you know, the person who's actually doing the work and the person who is on the award stand is the athlete. And just like, you know, it takes amazing parents too. It takes an Amer amazing family system and it, it takes money and it takes uh, a lot. Um, but so, um, you know, there, you know, the, the, the um, Corollis wanted it to be about them. Mm -hmm. um, the, oh. yeah. um, you know, and, and I would say in our work to try to change the Olympic movement is that um, the Olympic Committee and the, the staffers, the people who, um, you know, they, they run the sports, um, I think they got a little confused and they really thought that it was about them, that all of those performances were what they did not what the athlete did. And, um, and that's why we had to work so hard, not just to remove the sexual abusers. Um, one of the things that um, we say all the time at Champion Women, and, uh, and I run, I'm a co-chair of this group called the Committee to Restore Integrity to the United States Olympic Committee, is one of the things we say all the time is that sexual abuse is a symptom of athletes having no power. So it's just one symptom. Another symptom is that the Olympic Committee won't pay for health insurance or pregnancy insurance. Now, if you're, uh, another symptom is that um, uh, hun literally hundreds of millions of dollars of new money flows into the system and athletes don't see any of it and half of the team is living below poverty level, right? Those are all symptoms of athletes having no power. And so that takes not, you can't just like, you know, get somebody fired, you know, one person or two people fired. You have to restructure the governance system in order to be able to get different results. Yeah, I, I feel that the one thing I can contribute is background in organizational behavior, organizational design, and understanding how culture works. And, you know, culture works by underlying assumptions. It's like the DNA or an algorithm that's driving how we behave, but they're hidden, so we don't know. And one of the hidden assumptions is that women, it's not that we can't play sport. We waste so much time arguing that. Of course we can, but it's that women aren't allowed to, or that they're, they're not... Um, it's not feminine, but it's a, it's a, there's a conflict between being a female and being an athlete. Yeah, let's, let's get away, do away with that one. <laughs> and that yeah, women aren't yeah. as valuable or valued, and there's this weird hierarchy, the power. So, of course, if we bring women into balanced power, and they have the same power as men in all ways, and athletes have the same power as coaches, that threatens the, the person at the top of a false hierarchy that shouldn't even be there anyway. And, but they'll protect it with their life. And I think, except that if we can bring everybody into a balanced power, uh, what's, what's the alternative? Well, that we're focused on something, not a person at the top, not some king, not some, you know, coach that uh, the Corollis, you know, but right. that we're focused on a principle, the grace and the beauty, the God spirit you talk about that, that sport offers. And if we're all focused on that, now we're partners and we're all seeking a similar and we can all achieve excellence, the coach included, but for coaching, not for the medal isn't theirs. I love seeing coaches. I don't know if you know our, tri our triathlete from the, the past, um, Whitfield, Simon Whitfield, but we had this chat about it. He goes, oh yeah, nowadays the coach is trying to get on the podium. Like it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Medal. Like they, they, the swimmer got the medal. It's not your medal. And that shouldn't be your medal. Your medal is good coaching. You can have a little prize about that if you want. Right, right. Craziness. Right. I mean, if that's your God spirit is, you know, you're there to, in service to somebody else being, coming a master at whatever this, then that endeavor is. And that is a, that is an amazing calling when people have that calling to be, to be a great coach. Yeah. I think coaches are, uh, it's the most important role in the world because you're responsible for a person's physical, mental, spiritual, emotional development. And that's, yep. that's huge, bigger than anybody else, really. 
All right, you're touching on some of the amazing projects that you've gotten involved in and that you've spearheaded. This takes time. You have three children, twins. Like I just kind of, again, you're <laughs> yeah. a bit of that every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Hard work. And, um, you know, that those 10,000 million hours and kilometers. I used to have a roommate who swam. And I'm like, you swim as far as I row. Like, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. No, no, it's because you don't have gravity. Like a sprinter swimmer swims further than a marathon runner runs. Because again, you're not, you're not pounding, right? So every sport pushes right up to the point of injury. And in swimming, that point is, you know, it's a lot further <laughs> out there than, than other sports. So, but okay. yeah. So yeah, can you tell us about some of the projects that you're involved in? You know, before we go there though, I also want to highlight how you've intersected, right? That being in this realm of women in sport is really important. It's allowed you to influence all sorts of other avenues like violence and corruption and inequality in other realms of the world. So uh, yeah, really important. Highlight that. What are some of the projects? You okay. Yep. So we champion women. Uh, we have, we're in, we have two major projects right now and we need money for them. So I'll just get that out there front because they don't can't happen by themselves. Um, one is um, we are committed to remedying the intentional sex discrimination that goes on in intercollegiate athletics. So um, we uh, in America we have a website that all schools have to submit data to. It's called the EADA, and if you just type in your Google search bar EADA, just those four letters, it'll come up and you can see how your school, uh, you know, how many students that there are and how many male, female, and then how many male, female athletes. And you can see budgets and you can see how many scholarship dollars. It's, it's amazing. There's a ton of really, really great information that's there. But if you're not a lawyer and you don't know what you're looking for, <clears throat> it's hard to look at that data and say whether or not it's fair to ask the school for more sports opportunities for women. So a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of athletic directors will dupe a family and say, oh, we have the same number of sports for men as we do for women. Therefore, we have equality. When in fact, they may have twice as many male men participating in sports than women because the sports they pick for men are just, you know, they have more athletes, particularly football. So um, we took that data downloaded it all. Um, we have, um, we, I hired uh, Janine Kistner. She's phenomenal. And she's a real math data kind of whiz person. So downloaded it all, did some mathematical formulas on it to show what's the gap between men and women? How many, how many athletes, how many sports opportunities do you need to add for men and women? And we, and it, it's just readily accessible. So you can look at your school and see that University of North Carolina needs to add 350 opportunities for women. 350, are you kidding? That's, that's 10 sports, new sports. They need to add six and a half million dollars every single year to their athletic department. Now remember, UNC Chapel Hill is in the power five. So these are the rich schools. These are the schools that where they're flush, they have, that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, you can go down and look at all these schools and just these enormous gaps, but it's, it's everything from, you know, 20 athletes here to, you know, 400 athletes over here that the school needs to add to make uh, men's and women's opportunities equally. We also found that we, you can look at it historically over time in this database, you can, it, it's a lot, but we did it. And we showed that actually uh, it's getting worse. Mm. There's a presumption that, well, with time, things are going to get better and it just takes a while. But, and that is fundamentally not true. Mm. Um, we, my champion women, for five years, we're, we've been writing to schools and explaining to them, taking the EA data and uh, how they, uh, how much more money they needed to give and how many more opportunities. And, um, and, and I can tell you, we failed. That project, we gave away millions of dollars in free legal work and it didn't work. It didn't move the dial. It didn't make things better for women. So 
in talking with other people, okay, we got to come up with new strategies. So we built this website. You can get onto it. It's called title, T I T L E I X schools.com, Title Nine Schools. And, uh, and you can look at every school and see how many opportunities do they need to add? How much scholarship dollars? How much recruiting dollars do they need to add? Those are just some easy metrics. There's, you, can, you can go a lot deeper into the data, um, but those three are, you know, are you giving them equal opportunities, scholarship dollars? 90% of schools are not. The total is a, a over a, if, if schools were providing men and women with equality, they would need to add 183,000 opportunities for women in sports. Uh, they need to add um, almost a billion dollars in college scholarships. That's the part that really infuriates me. Um, and then, you know, multi, multi billions in scholar in um, recruiting dollars, which is like, you know, how you're treating men and women. Um, um, and I have to say, there is a part of the women's movement, there's a part of all of us where feeling anger at those, at that, those stats is really uncomfortable. And I get it, it is uncomfortable to look at that. Um, it is uncomfortable for us to look at the overt sexism when Sarah Fuller, the, the kicker who just played at, uh, at uh, uh, Vanderbilt University, um, uh, to, to, to look at how so many of the comments are anti-woman saying, oh, can she make me a sandwich? Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope she gets gang banged in the locker room. Oh, I, but to not look at the hard truth is to be ineffective. We have, uh, th there are some people that you can't expect them to be the ones to be out front, right? So don't ever expect your female coach to be the one to, to be, to say the things that I'm saying right now, because they will get fired. Okay. So don't expect them. They're not going to be your, the advocates who are out front. None of them have job security. Um, they, they just can't do it. So don't go there. But our, we as humans in wanting to be happy, happy, joy, joy, um, will not go and confront and really address the issue. So happy, happy, joy, joy, while, you know, I, I have um, several meditation apps on my phone and those are important, but I also need to be able to use the infuriate, infuriating anger yeah. that I get from, uh, from looking at how schools are, are going out of their way. Schools have made 10,000 decisions to come up with the athletic departments that they do that are not equal with men. Um, we have 48 years of law. We have the regulations. We have the case law. We have amazing lawyers who have already dedicated their lives to making sure that women have these opportunities. And in um, our efforts as schools are getting, are dropping sports, we kind of herd the cats as I call it and uh, get the, get families and athletes and um, coaches and alumni and donors, get them all together and say, okay, here's one way that you can go, which is litigation. Um, we just have to get louder. We have got to get louder. And, and there, there is a, hmm, I don't, I don't quite, Jen, I don't quite know the word to use, but there is, if you can get comfortable being angry um, and, and let it fuel you, there is a, there, there is a, um, it is a source of, of emotion that, um, can be really productive. I have to say, you know, when I was, when I used to fight with my rapist when I was training under the water, I recognized that it made me go faster. That being that angry and letting that, you know, run through me, that that made, right, I could use it for something productive. So I don't want to unleash that on, you know, my dear husband or my beautiful children, right? But I do want to use that. And I, I, I just see, um, that this, this, um, you know, people, you know, just ignore the things that they're saying about Sarah Fuller, just, you know, 
just you know try to do as well as you can in the university no we're we've got to fix this intentional sex discrimination because we are uh, women who get a collegiate sports experience make 7% more than their peers over their lifetime. So when you think 183,000 women being denied earning 7% more over their lifetime is a loss to everyone. Mm -hmm. And like, I can hardly wait to get going right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I love that the channeling into doing something particular productive and fixing it because that is it right. it's not just about shaking your fist and being indignant and angry it's about channeling the energy and, and changing right things. yeah write us a check so that we can go do more okay. yep, yep, yep. or contact you know it's it's hard sometimes people say like oh, i want to help and it's like i want them to be able to help but it's hard to like find like where's the skill set match okay here's what i need but and what they're good at isn't what right so you don't want to yeah, yeah, yeah so i need i need the check yeah <laughs> louder and litigation like go for it instead of it's funny i've been through a few cases and my advice too is to to hit harder and faster and earlier and don't wait and don't trust the process because it isn't uh, gonna work <laughs> you know there is intentional as you say i love the word intentional discrimination it they work very hard to preserve that little top of the hierarchy and the power that uh, they have the privilege of having right now. So lots yeah. of effort goes into that. We see, see it always. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. So that's project number one. Another big project that we have been uh, doing, been engaged in, I kind of, I got in through it through the sexual abuse world and has now moved into, we just got our second piece of major federal legislation, United States legislation passed that restructures how the Olympic committee works. So it's the same in Canada. Um, um, our Olympic movement is, since 1978 is governed by a statute called the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. I've been teaching sports law now for almost 20 years, and in that time, I've had less than, less than a dozen students who even knew that there was a statute, uh, let alone what it says, what it does, etc. So it governs power. And... Um, we say that the athlete's voice, the, 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 that the interests of athletes needs to have a voice at the table, right? We looked at different models, right? You could have had a union, you could have had a, right? But, you know, a table tennis athlete and a tennis player uh, and a swimmer, and right, they have such different interests, it's harder to do it that way. So we, we said, have equal um, uh, weight or voting power on the board so that when new money comes in, where does the money go? Hmm, should we give it to the staff? Should we give it to the CEO <laughs> and have them keep continuously get richer and richer? Or should, how much should athletes get of that money? Um, how, much, uh, how much should go into facilities? Uh, how much should go into coaching? How much, right? So the athletes, again, that their their authority and their seat at the table is not based on this obedience and compliance model, and that um, um, that um, that yeah. So that, so that's fundamentally what we what we tried to do. The first statute was called protecting young. Uh, young victims from sexual abuse and safe sport authorization act. I know it's a long name. Uh, so that was the first one, which made like everybody in our Olympic movement, which is about it's 16 million athletes, about half are children, half are adult. And then on top of that, it you know then you've got on top you know all the administrators and all that. So it made them all mandatory reporters and it uh, gave people longer statute of limitations to be able to file their claims and it made it impermissible for adults to be alone with children unless it was an emergency and it did a, a, a whole bunch of things but it was all about protecting. Mm -hmm. This second piece that we just got passed about a month ago has to do with uh, that power restructure, restructuring that I was talking about. If those of you who have not seen Athlete A, I recommend that you do so. Um, it was produced by Jen Say, who's a good friend. Um, and, um, but you know, Athlete A is Maggie Nichols. And Maggie Nichols was not only kept from being in commercials, 
where um, Simone Biles wanted to have her in the commercials. Not only were her parents not featured in Olympic trials, even though she was the national champion the year before, but she was kept off the Olympic team because she was athlete A, the first athlete that complained about Larry Nasser. And, um, you know, the, 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 the sport itself didn't, didn't want to, uh, th they wanted to make as much money as possible and they wanted the athletes to win and that's all they cared about. And, and until athletes are sitting at the table and can make those decisions on, um, on, you know, what kinds of policies that we're going to have, um, you're, you're going to continue to, to see issues like that. So it gives somebody like the, the second statute gives somebody like Maggie Nichols, um, a, a, a way for them to be able to recover for their, for the retaliation that they suffered. Um, um, yeah, so it's good. It does, it does a lot. We're not quite done yet, but, but we're getting there. And I love how you start by protecting, put policies in place that look after these kids, and then now let's balance the power, get them at the table. Um, I had a coach say to me one time, yeah, but there's, that's a problem. You know, you empower those athletes and they're going to speak up and, and um, the coaches aren't really ready for that. And are they, is the system ready for that? I'm like, I don't care. I, <laughs> <laughs> because they, they better get ready because the athletes are coming. And yeah, I, right. Sure. right. No, I, I, the, so I was shocked, you know, I mean, if you had asked me to talk about rape back when, at, when I was raped, I, I literally could not have done it. And now you have all these very, not, not now, starting around, I would say 1995 is, you know, remember we had the movie, The Hunting Ground, and mm -hmm. you had these very young women who, college age women who were demanding that their school uh, get their abuser out of the school. And they wanted to stay. They didn't. They didn't want to transfer, right? They wanted to stay, and they were right? so they they didn't have any shame about having been sexually assaulted, and um, and, and anyway, so the, so they right and how younger and younger how that these athletes are um, they are speaking out. This athlete activism is amazing. I I re, I even recognize you know. I was an athlete activist uh, even back in the day. Donna Deverona got me up to speed on Title IX just enough for me. Every time I got a microphone in my face, I talked about Title IX. And at that time, it was in danger. Of, it, we had a bad Supreme Court decision. In the United States, Title IX is the law that says you can't discriminate against women in sports. Or it, I'm sorry, it says you can't discriminate, discriminate against women in education, sport mm -hmm. being part of education, right? Uh, and, uh, so, you know, I, I, I did every time somebody would talk, I would say how important the statute was and it enabled me to be able to get a full scholarship. But anyway, but these women, these athletes now are recognizing, particularly with social media out there, what a platform that they have to be able to make social change on a number of issues, right? And they really get to pick whether it's Black Lives Matter or the environment, um, or, um, you know, the rights of those with different abilities to, um, to you know, just non-discrimination to what, whatever their issue is, they have this opportunity to really make a difference. The, the youth, and these young women, young athletes, they're coming without the prior knowledge. They haven't been corrupted by our culture. These things haven't been inculcated. So they come out and and they can recognize maltreatment really quickly. I found myself, a number of girls were coming for help and I found myself trying to make sense and rationalize the coach's behavior because of how I've been raised, right? Like to kind of, oh, well, maybe. But they were like, well, no, it's just gotta stop. Like it's wrong and I don't care if you mentioned or not, it, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, we have to really listen to the, the youth. And it leads me to ask you about education. You talk about some of your students, not even, hardly any of your students really knowing about these statutes, right? And I find the same with safe sport. We have some good policy in place, but the educational component is missing. We're not, it's almost like the, NS, the national sport organizations are a little afraid to share because they don't want the floodgate. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> um, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna run out of time. I don't wanna take up everybody's time, but 
I have a lot to say about that. So the, the Mac Daddy problem of sexual abuse in sport is men sexually abusing their young athletes, both male and female. That's the Mac, that, th there are there, about 20% of the issue is peer sexual abuse. And there's a tiny percentage of, you know, somebody sneaking into a locker room. That's like, you know, one or 2%. The Mac Daddy, the, the, the way to make sports substantially safer for students is for everybody, for that six-year-old, seven-year-old kid all the way to every coach to know that the golden rule is, and Jill Yesko I know is gonna be saying it right along with me, but the golden rule is coaches shall not have romantic or sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age or consent. So that means coaches, there's a bright line rule um, and there's no such thing as a consensual relationship when there's a coaching relationship, the same way that it's true for counselors and doctors and lawyers and therapists and um, prison guards and right. Whenever you have this hierarchical relationship, there is no such thing and it interferes with those third parties the dynamics right so you know, some of our dear friends, um, um, Dia Rianda, who tried to report and she gets excommunicated from her own community. Uh, Eva Rodansky should have the words, have the letters O-L-Y after her name, and she doesn't because the coach was having a relationship with one, with her rival. Um, so, but, but there's a reluctance for national governing bodies to say it that plainly because that's not how coaches want it languaged. They, oh, don't get me started. Right, too bad. Yeah, no, easy peasy. Coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach regardless of age or consent. Those who hold the power now seem to be just holding that power into eternity and we just can't have it. We need to somehow wrest that away from them <laughs> and get it back to, you know, everybody. Well, I mean, but, but hold on. I mean, I mean, really good coaches, the, you know, the vast majority of my coaches, all of my coaches except for one would have no problem saying it just like that. I would have no, would, would welcome that, would think, right? That, that that's how a ethical coach behaves. Well, duh, of course. Um, and, um, yeah, but there, there is a group that they don't want it taught that way because they don't want even the possibility that they could come up in front of the U S center for safe sport. Right. Yeah. It's quite amazing. It's quite amazing that the same, my daughter and I did that exercise counting back all our coaches, you know, it's about 30 coaches you end up having if you, if you've been in sport for that long in high school and 30 coaches and out of that one, one of us, each of us had one. So right. it's great, it's, but you can't rely on the good, good moral character of a person in any kind of position of power. You need to have governance in place that you say that ensures that no pedophiles are walking through that door. They won't right. be attracted to it and they're not welcome. Not yeah, and I have to say that process of getting pedophiles out is expensive and contentious and it breaks up communities. Uh, the gymnastics community right now is experiencing that breaking up. Um, the, the, the legal fights, the, it, it is, I, when I think of how much Larry Nassar has cost, right, it's not just the money of, I, I mean, right, you think like for our criminal system and what, you know, he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Uh, the, but the Olympic movement, including all the national governing bodies, have spent well over $50 million on looking at the system and what's right and wrong with it. Um, uh, um, uh, Michigan State University paid um, over half a billion dollars for victims of sexual abuse. The Olympic Committee, they're in still in litigation right now. They're trying, the Olympic Committee and uh, USA Gymnastics are both trying to say, not our fault, not our problem. We don't owe a duty that extends to this athlete. Um, so, no, crazy expensive. 
crazy how much money it is that they drain off. And then, but, the but, 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 but guess what? We have to do it because we have to make sports safe. You can't just say like, you know, I just don't want to spend that money. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Got to be fixed. Got to get the work done. And the right. cost of these young women's lives. Yeah, they, their lives have not been ruined. Megan Nichols is a good example of someone who was able to reclaim, recover, but others not. And I know lots of girls who, who can't and they shouldn't be judged for that. That's another irritation, but they've lost years. They've lost memories. They've lost experiences, possibilities. Uh, they've had to spend time recovering when they shouldn't have had to. And, right. And yeah, yeah, they've learned to become stronger and all these things, but the cost is enormous to the cost is it? Yeah, the, yeah the, I, when I was just talking about the hard cost on what it costs sport, but but the cost on the the victim and it's men and it's it's boys typically boys, girls and women are the three categories. The cost is just um, incalculable. I'm I'm 58 years old and I will always have a big dog because I just fundamentally don't feel safe without it. Right. And from something that happened for two and a half hours when I was only 19 years old, but I will always have a big dog. Yeah. I mean, that, that just shows like the depth of the harm that, that, uh, can, that comes out of being sexually abused or assaulted. Yes. Um, and, and dogs are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great solution. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. thank you so much. And, and oh, Jen, you're welcome. Fighting. And I love this too, the connection. I'm seeing so many people who joined in uh, Lincoln Arms in this big fight. The work you started by talking about the learning is just do the work. Let's just get the work. Yeah, put things aside. Yes, we have anger. Yes, this is not fair. And we need to channel that indignation, not just shake our fists, but actually get the work done. We've got exactly. some questions and comments. And uh, oh, I see my good friend. Yeah, if, if I, besides your money, which I desperately need, please give me your money. Okay, <laughs> besides that. Um, we, uh, also, if you want to like find out what we're doing, we, when we send out an email, and hopefully our friends will like be nodding or say nice things in the comments, but we try really hard all of our communications to you by email to be value added. We don't just ask for money all the time or, you know, some of these political ads, they just drive me crazy. You're like, just get, right? They, they, they're not value added. They don't um, leave you better off. They don't leave you more informed. And we really, really try hard. So our website is championwomen.org. And um, if you will sign up for our uh, communications, um, you know, we, we um, on so many different topics, we, we really try hard. I love it. And, and it is value add and have signed up. And it is part of that net, network, right? Building, linking the arms, because stronger together for sure. And we have to join forces to get this kind of work done. It's insurmountable right now. If we can invest the time and the energy and work together, we can fix it. And then we'll be more sustainable and we'll have reclaimed the sport we love and the sport we want as well. And uh, enabled all these young women to really, there's your link and we're sharing it, but we'll share it as well. Um, when we put out our recording and our messages, we've got some questions for you. Do you have okay. anything you wanna, do you wanna highlight anything else you're working on right now before we go to questions? Um, Things um, yeah, I mean, th those are the two big projects we're trying to, you know, work on the structure with the Olympic movement and we're trying to, you know, just these little things, just trying to end sex discrimination <laughs> in sport. <laughs> yeah, no, that's our language, man. We, we believe in it as well and really want to work toward making change. And we know it starts with this kind of fire, right? And connecting people up. So we've got a few questions. If people want to click on participants, you put your hand up so that we can keep track. Uh, we'd love it if you can turn your mic on. It's more human, but you can also post your questions in the chat. So if we have a look over at the chat and see a few questions here, uh, lots of people just cheer you on and, and love it. Oh, um, and people saying, you know, this has really been eye opening, but also an informative. And I think that's a big um, mission of yours, right? Is to really educate people. I see that 
man, you're busy on social. And I love that too, because you're constantly bringing into focus and highlighting some of the issues in the world and the ways we can change them. Okay. Um, yeah. Does anybody, anybody, any hands up? Anybody like to ask a question of Nancy? I always have tons, so I can keep this going. If so one, of, one of the things, as you find a good question, I'll just add in this other little point that one of the things that, <clears throat> um, like when when we recognize that I, my co-chair for the committee to restore integrity to the olympic committee is ed williams and he's done more litigation against uh national governing bodies like usa track and field usa swimming etc uh uh when an athlete has a conflict with their national governing body okay so uh at one point there was a the, the ceo scott blackman he essentially left athletes high and dry and said, if an athlete had an issue, they, they, were, they had some, there was a protected competition, they should have been protected. He said, you know, the Olympic Committee is not going to help you. You need to go, what's called a Section 9 complaint. Okay, so this guy, Ed Williams, has done more than anybody else. He's a treasure trove of information out there. So both of us, I've been teaching sports law for 20 years, and we know so much. And frankly, it's not rocket science out there. But we thought athletes and the Olympic community would be so well served if people did know the history and the background and the, the power dynamics and whatnot. Um, that sport would be better if people knew what it was that we knew, because what was happening was Scott Blackman and the board of the Olympic Committee was using the fact that people didn't know as a way to keep money for themselves and to deny responsibility and in ways that were wildly inappropriate. They tried to say when Larry Nassar came out in uh, the beginning of 2018, that um, <clears throat> we, the Olympic Committee, we can't tell in national governing bodies what to do. That, 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 that uh, they, these are independent businesses. And we took all these quotes from newspapers and then we wrote a two page legal memo to say nonsense, nonsense, right? But members of Congress didn't even know, like you've already given them the power to be able to police, to, um, to, uh, to oversee, to uh, you know, have independent oversight over national governing bodies. Um, so this idea that the, it, it, it just, it wasn't true, but, but they were depending on the Olympic movement not knowing, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so all we had to do was say, you know, here are the citations and here, <clears throat> here's the, the, inf the information um, so that um, so that you Olympic Committee at the board at the time um, cannot get away with this nefarious, you know, Passing. literally the executives were treating themselves in five star hotels and then like saying like, um, you know, athletes are staying in like sort of sub dorms. Right. And they're, they are in America, it's, they're living below poverty level. Um, they um, are, are just like, you know, with me, I, I was in the era of amateurism. Yeah. Um, amateurism died in 1992. Yeah. There was no such thing. And yet athletes don't, Olympic athletes are not getting a share of the money that's coming in. Anyway, so part of our goal of creating this group and was and getting other athletes to sign on was we, right now we have 550 Olympians, Paralympians and elite athletes like national team level athletes um, was it was our way of inculcating them with these values of because the Olympic movement means so much to all of us. Yeah. Oh, so much to all of us. And, and then they're just seeing it dribble through their fingers and so to give them the power and unite them, right, in one space so they can feel that they're like this big army of warriors. Awesome. Right, right. Yeah. Love it. Okay, I've got a question for you here around um, 
this is a really interesting one, taking it kind of out of sport. But I think, again, that's what sport can teach us is that it doesn't always have to be through sport. Um, sport can model these kinds of principles. And you're teaching people all sorts of things through sport uh, about how to change power structures and hold people accountable and remind them of their responsibilities. I just love it when boards act like they're not supposed to be governing the organization. Uh, and they don't, they can't tell people what to do. Uh, yeah, you can. That's why you're there. It's got to stop somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> right, right. this person says, I know this webinar is about more opportunities for sport, but what can we do for our daughters who are not in sports to help them get to the C-suite, you know, or advance or achieve equality? What did that small percent of non-sport executive have that we can foster in others? Hmm. Hmm. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Um, I mean, um, you know, my, my kids are athletes, but they're not elite athletes. You know, it's not, it's not about being an elite athlete, but that whole mind, body, spirit thing is a thing. It really is important that people have a good relationship with their body and how that connects with people's leadership abilities, right? We're not heads that are dislocated from the rest of our, of, of ourselves. Um, you know, really loving your body and taking care of your body and, you know, through all the different stages in life um, is the sooner people can learn that, the better. I mean, I learned to love my body when I was in, in sports. I was not in a sport like gymnastics where I had to be, you know, I had to starve myself. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but, but, but in addition to sport, you know, it is finding what speaks to somebody, what their God spirit is, what their, what calling do they have? Um, you know, I, one of my daughters right now, one of her callings, she's all excited. She's in the 0.05%, so not 1%, not a half a percent, right? 0.05% of all Taylor Swift's listeners, okay? She's, she's a bit, and I don't really know where it's gonna go for her. Right. I don't, I, I have some ideas. Um, she's not a performer. She's not a singer. Um, but, um, but like, that's like, she's really drawn to that. She's really right. And I think one of the things that my parents did for me and my siblings was they kind of figured out what the thing was for us and then made it that happen. And I'm trying to do the same thing with my kids. Like, what is your thing? And then, and then whatever I need to do to, uh, to um, empower that. My parents are not swimmers. They're not, they didn't like going to swim meets. They didn't like going to pray. No, it was not their gig at all. Um, but, you know, they, they made it happen. And so I, it's the same kind of thing. It's like finding out from that person, like, what is their, what, what, um, what moves them? What strikes them? What are, what are they fascinated by? What do they have a hard time looking away from? What are they, you know, all that good stuff. But I love the word God spirit because I, I, there's a favorite, I used to teach English when I'm in another life, but there's a beautiful poem about touching the face of God when mm. the guy who's flying a plane, you know, and it doesn't matter what it is, rowing or swimming or flying a plane or playing a cello, that you're touching the face of God and it's that, mm, very special. So what sport can model is that, that beauty, right? And, and really listening to your calling. I love that too, that phrase, your calling. Mm. That's crucial. But you also made a point about mind, body, spirit. And I, I think yeah. you know, you're not being an elite athlete, but it's important to do something physical and active. And it doesn't have to be a sport even. It could be um, any kind of physical activity. Right. Yoga or Pilates or just you know, go for a run because it's a wonderful thing to do. It doesn't have to be to go and win in the Olympics. Right. Yeah. Like I'm a little, you think a little competitive and um, it can kind of get me in trouble. And so in sport, like now as a 58 year old, or really since uh, 1984, I can't get involved in competitive sport because it just kind of takes over my life. <laughs> right. So I just, I just want to be in shape. I want my body to be able to support me in, you know, in, in being great in other ways. But I, um, oh my God, I was in a race. I was like, I did a triathlon like 
just for fun. And um, when somebody passed me, I heard them say, I just beat an Olympian. I was like, oh no, 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 we are, right? So it's just not, anyway, so, um, so I understand that even if I'm not in competitive sport, that taking care of my body means taking care of my spirit, taking care of my soul, taking care of my emotional uh, life. Um, yeah, those are, uh, it's important, you know, knowing your body is really important. Beautiful. People asked about power structure and, you know, we talk quite a bit about power. What is, what's the answer? You know, where do we, what are we fighting for in terms of power? You know, you have a coach that's then in a relationship with their athlete it makes everyone behave terribly. It's the wrong situation. The strong, it's the wrong. Um, yeah. Power dynamic. How do we fix that? What do we focus on? Where do we channel our energy? What's the work to be done? Here, yeah, if you go on to, when, when you go on to Champion Women, not only do I want you to give me money and sign up for our website, but also there's a, a link there. We work very hard with Child USA, another phenomenal organization um, uh, out of Philadelphia, and um, uh, on you know like a one pager that is perfect for again seven year olds, parents, coaches, administrators. Okay. And it goes through like number one, the number one rule is coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athlete coach, girls of age or consent. Okay, that's number one. And then it goes through like what are the boundaries between coaches and athletes, and where should you not cross over, right? So we and we phrase it in terms of like how if I was a coach or how my coaches would have presented it to me, which is a good ethical coach will not try to be alone with you. A good ethical coach will not connect with you on social media. If you're part of a team and everybody's in the same team, a good ethical coach will not text you or email you individually. They'll either include your parents, your, or your, um, caregivers or the rest of the team, right? So it's not a, uh, a good ethical coach uh, will not give you a gift, including food. No matter how well you just did, they, that's not where you get your gifts. Um, a good, right? And so we, it goes through a list of, of boundaries between coaches and athletes. Um, a good ethical coach will not throw equipment or things at you. A good ethical coach will recognize the difference between um, a, a, a pain and injury. Um, they will not require you or belittle you or humiliate you when you are injured. Um, you know, right? So it has a whole list of boundaries between coaches and athletes that every athlete should know. Like, it's like, of course. Yes. Yeah. We really do have to inculcate. I love that word too. And make sure that it's in everyone's back pocket. It's on every website. It's a familiar, we have this thing rule of two and it's really taken off well because it's easy to remember and it's easy to make sense of. Right. 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 right? And right. Just, of course, right. But it's good to see um, around power. And oh, there was another comment. Yeah, what do you say? What is the other thing I really think is powerful is when we have the language, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get, when those terrible comments are coming up that really sexualize women, um, demoralize, oppress, suppress, or they say, well, you're just not tough enough, you don't deserve it. Like, what's the answer? How do we respond to, uh, my friend said to me today, because I was telling her about this. She had a student say, well, I, I realized I, I wasn't comfortable with this coach. He was very, he was aggressive and violent and abusive in his language. And w my parents and I told him, and he said, oh no, it's just because I care. You should be worried. If I stop yelling at you, it means I don't care. What, what's the answer? Because I think it dumbfounds people. And this poor kid, of course, kind of took that in and went, oh, okay, he just cares about me. How do we respond to that? How do we counter? What's the retort, you know, to that kind of... Argument? Yeah, this is where um, social media really can play this great part is that, you know, that's gaslighting. 
that's somebody knows that something's not true. They know that they're being harmed and somebody's saying they're not being harmed and they're supposed to swallow that. That's gaslighting. That's, uh, uh, and, and um, just you saying it right now, Ari, and like somebody will turn it into a meme and they'll, they'll, you know, expose it and they'll, uh, right. But the more that people can kind of have those conversations, um, this is why I just think it's so important for people to have conversations um, about hard negative things and make it okay, right? To find people who are good at that. Um, um, in in um, in almost all my presentations, or even if I put something up on Facebook, uh, let's say it's about sexual abuse or something, the first three comments will always be the same. And the first one is kill him. Second one is put him in prison for the rest of his life. The third one is um, uh, um, chop off his testicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I get it. People are angry that somebody would abuse a child or, or would uh, uh, abuse the power that they were given. Okay. But none of those three are ever going to happen and it's not going to do anything. It's a wonderful sort of barfing outrage, right? And I get it. That is, a, you know, the importance of barfing outrage. But guess what? It's not going to make your kids safer for you to say, like, I would go and kill that person. Actually, kids don't tell their parents uh, that they have been abused because they don't want that person to die. Like, the, the kid take, takes it on as themselves, right? So, um um we we um i i had like when i give a speech or something i, I didn't do it here but <laughs> your, your audience seems like people seem to be nodding along um but uh when i give a speech is i try to like have people move from that reactive part of the brain into the thinking part of the brain about how do you strategically make sure that kids are safe not kill them, chop off their testicles, or put them in prison for the rest of their lives. It's just not going to happen. Instead, you have to think over here of, huh, what kind of training does somebody need to be able to, to take a, a report of abuse? Okay, how are we going to investigate it? Okay, what kinds of evidence are going to admit? Okay, what, when we have a hearing, who, who, what kind of person is going to be the arbitrator? What, what qualifications do they need? Um, you know, how do we make sure that it's a fair process, that both parties understand that it's a fair process? And then if, if it turns out that the person did uh, violate the, 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 the rules and let's say they get a ban, how do we enforce that ban? Okay. Um, all those steps along the, the, the okay, that, that requires a lot of thoughtful thinking and um, people putting in hours of work in creating the process and then fulfilling the process, right? Um, you know, it's like um, in America, we have an HR department, a human resources department. Do you have the same in Canada? Okay, so a good, right, everybody knows that there's a difference between a good HR department and a bad HR department, right? How do you make sure that the, essentially the United States Center for Safe Sport is supposed to be like an HR department for the entire you know, multi-millions of people in the Olympic movement? It determines like who's in, who's out. Um, it provides that oversight. So how do you make sure that it doesn't get captured by the other side and, uh, and, and be all about protecting the Olympic movement, right? That was one of the things that this last statute did was um, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport gets $20 million a year from the Olympic Committee without having to lobby for it. Right. They don't have to like be in their good graces. The right. Olympic Committee can be mad at them and they still get $20 million a year. Um, right. We, we gave them this independence. We made sure that people who work for the U.S. Olympic Committee cannot have come from the Olympic side of things. OK, so you don't have this sort of back and forth and back and forth. And pretty soon, like there's no real distinction between those two. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that those are just a, a few of the ways of 
um, you know, earlier I was saying how expensive that um, sexual abuse is. Um, creating a process and making sure it's a fair process for everyone is also a, 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 a worthy endeavor. Yes, and expensive takes investment, takes commitment. Right. And, um, and we're, fight, we're battling a commitment to what my buddy calls a myth, the myth of machismo or the infatuation with violence or this power over, uh, we're comfortable with power over and we, we really need to bring the power into balance. Like you illustrated with, even if we're not in your good graces, you still gotta give us the 20 mil. <laughs> you know, that's a really good illustration of that. The rule is, so we are not begging or we're not um, becoming patronizing in any way to try to get that money. But it makes everybody behave badly when there's this power imbalance. Cool. We are out of time and uh, we have a lot of positive comments. We're really appreciative of you giving us this much time. It's a huge gift. And what I love Thank too, is a beautiful bridge between our countries where we have very similar, you know, we're smaller, we're a tenth of the size, but we we're having similar uh, structures. I can relate to a lot of the principles you're talking about. And obviously a lot of the challenges, we're all linking arms and, and fighting for these. You're a huge inspiration, Nancy, to so many people uh, in the work that you do and your relentless pursuit of that and your channeling of that anger, because we all feel it. It's so frustrating to feel so powerless. Uh, and you give us hope that we're, we're gonna fix this. So thank you so much for spending the time and uh, we'll be in touch and I'm sure we will share out everything you've got and try oh, thank you Jennifer thank you thank you very much you know I really appreciate this opportunity and you all like I, I just see like a some heads at the top and like it keeps changing and every person here is just I can feel the um the warmth and the head nods and it's great thank you all very much thank you so much signing off yeah. great have a great mom. have a great afternoon love to all your family well, take care. Bye.